Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Gathering Online. I'm Steve Terry, and so glad that you are here. I know you're coming in from the North Campus, uh, from the East Campus, as well as from Central, and we just thank God for everybody. Uh, we, in fact, we really are grateful uh, to have the live streaming, and, uh, and as we live stream from week to week, uh, it, it just, to me at least, when I go and, and take a look at the Word or the series, the series makes so much more sense. I don't know uh, who all is on there, but what I want you to do is just begin to chat some uh, things or type some things into the chat. Uh, something that you may be thankful for this week or someone who you may see as they uh, come on. Just say hello. Say good morning to somebody. Uh, just type it in the chat. And so, again, as you're coming on, um, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, number one, you want to make sure if you are new uh, to Grace Gathering, then um, why don't you uh, go on, uh, log on the Internet, uh, catch us on the website, gracegathering.com slash new. And we want to make sure that we get connected to you. And then for those who want to get more connected or have more families, then uh, uh, not only your family or maybe friends or maybe neighbors, uh, let them know that they can also connect deeper uh, with us in small groups, gracegathering.com slash groups. And so when you type that in, um, you'll get more information, like uh, especially this series, there'll be a small, a short video, uh, there'll be questions uh, that you can answer. And the questions really help us uh, throughout my week, at least for me, when I get a few questions to prompt or to remind me of what the message was about, it really does my heart good. And then finally, giving. Um, giving, uh, gracegathering.com slash give. Uh, you can continue uh, to contribute and help us uh, to continue in the live streaming. Um, anyway, I'm so glad to be with you. I know there's some kids on there. I want to say hey to all of the children who, uh, I'm, even if you hope you're awake, if you're awake, um, I want you to have so much fun with us on Grace Gathering Live. Uh, so glad to be with you. Again, I'm Steve Terry, and I'm from the Central Campus. And so, again, for all of you who are uh, joining us there, there's watch parties going on as well. And so we're just glad uh, to be uh, together as a family. And so in just a minute, uh, we're going to join into a time of worship in this celebration. So again, welcome, 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 welcome. Everybody, as you're coming in the room, want to welcome you to Grace Gathering Online. Uh, welcome from the north, welcome from east, welcome from central. We're going to join in together as a family and worship. Whether you, you, it's best for you standing um, or sitting or if you can't do anything but wave a hand, we worship together. So come on and worship the Lord, the King of glory, the Lord God strong and mighty. Good morning, friends, family. Welcome this morning. Hope you're ready to worship uh, this morning. I want to invite you to stand wherever you are today. As we prepare our hearts to step into the truth about who it is that we worship, uh, a thought came to mind this morning that the old ancient cathedrals were built in such a way that when you walked in, the doorways were just massive to kind of give you a perspective of who it is you were coming in to, uh, to encounter. And so this morning, Psalm 24 reminds us that the glory of the Lord is bigger than any doorway we can imagine. There is no building, no cathedral, no house that can contain his glory. And yet the irony in that is that his design was to live in our hearts. And so we're gonna, uh, we wanna just encourage you this morning to open up your heart because that's where the King of glory wants to live. And there is a peace that is within reach even in the midst of all of this that's going on in the world, there is a peace that comes when the King of glory enters your heart. 
The book of Philippians tells us that that peace is beyond under understanding. So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but this huge, massive king of glory wants to live in our hearts and bring us peace. So let's worship him this morning, this king of glory.
are the king of my heart. You are the king of my heart, Jesus. You are. You are the king of my heart. You are the king of my heart. You are the king of my heart, Jesus. My heart be a temple, and let that temple have a throne. And the one who sits upon it be you and you alone.
lift up the protection that we placed around our hearts that we think protects us. The things that get in the way of allowing you to come in. We swing wide the gates to let you come in and have your way. Have your way. In Jesus' name. Hey everyone, my name is Brian Menzi. So good to be here with you this morning. My wife Shandy and I are a part of our Grace Gathering North family. And this morning we're continuing our series called Love and Hope, How to Encourage One Another. We're, we're going through this letter of First Thessalonians. And while today's topic might not seem all that encouraging, we're talking about spiritual warfare I promise you it will end up encouraging. And just to give you a sense of what this morning will look like is we'll have to do a bit of groundwork up front to kind of unearth some biases and, and get stuff cleared out of the way so that we can have open minds to really listen to what Paul wants to say. And just so that you can uh, stay with me and, and keep along, I want to give you my outline right up front. It, so it'll make everything crystal clear. Uh, first, we'll talk about chronocentrism. Of course, where else would you start? Uh, then we'll move on to leprechauns, followed by litmus tests, lenses, and finally, a word of encouragement. I hope that clears everything up for you. That's where we'll be today. Well, let's pray and ask God to speak to us this morning. God, I am aware that you have something for your people today. That you want to open their eyes to, to wisdom, to reality, to what is going on around them. So that they can see you at work, so that they can trust you more. And so that ultimately you can get all the glory So I, t I pray that today would be an encouragement for everyone and that we would hear your voice and respond to what you're saying. In Jesus' name, amen. So first, chronocentrism. You know, everything happens for a reason. God will never give you more than you can handle. Why did God do this to me? I, I don't deserve it. God's just trying to teach me something by giving me this disease or diagnosis. Why do bad things happen to good people? Have you ever heard any of these uh, responses or Christian cliches? Maybe you've even said them before. I know that I've been guilty of saying things like this at different times. The question is, what do all of these things have in common? Well, I'm glad you asked. Essentially, all of these statements are sort of everyday language for what philosophers call the problem of evil. Essentially, it's this question, how can a God who's perfectly loving and all-powerful allow evil in the world? Certainly, if he's all-loving, he doesn't want evil things and, and broken things uh, to hurt his people. And if he's all powerful, then he could stop it. Maybe you've heard this question before. So there was a church leader and philosopher called St. Augustine who wrote about this problem way back in around 400 AD. And ever since, our church has been absolutely obsessed with this very question. And with each passing generation, there's been more books and more thinkers and more lectures and more philosophy, philosophies presented and proposed on how we should deal with this problem. It's a topic that has overwhelmed Western Christian theology for hundreds of years. But here's the fascinating thing about this question. While it seems like a big deal to us, the biblical authors say almost nothing about it. I mean, no prophet offers some poetic dissertation on the matter. 
No apostle writes a theological essay outlining A, B, and C of why, uh, of reconciling these things. Jesus himself doesn't teach on it and, and explain it all away. So how could something seemingly that, that's so important to us seemingly be almost a non-issue for the authors of scripture? By the way, before I answer that question, I just wanna say this. You know, normally if we were doing this in person, uh, if I shared things that were challenging or, or difficult or confusing or, or you had some questions about, you could just come grab me afterwards. Of course, we can't do that. Uh, so I really welcome your emails. Anything that you have frustrations with, I welcome your emails. Write this down. You can email me at cnorman at gracegathering.com. cnorman at gracegathering.com. Email me. I would love to see your emails after today. Uh, but back to what we're talking about. Okay, so why don't these biblical authors seem nearly as concerned about this question as we do as modern Westerners? Well, the answer is simple. The biblical authors had what's called a warfare worldview. A warfare worldview. Now, what is a warfare worldview? To oversimplify it, you can think of it this way. On one hand, we have the natural world, and we can observe it through our five senses. It's inhabited by humans and animals, other organic materials. And as a part of the natural world, we have this kind of overarching story, this meta narrative we see in scripture, where early on after creation, there was this human rebellion, and that introduced all sorts of brokenness into the world. And so because of that, our actions have consequences. And sometimes our actions have positive consequences for ourselves and other people, but other time our actions have negative consequences for people. But that's just the natural world. See, a warfare worldview takes into account not just the natural world, but also the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is not observable with our five senses, but it can still, it's still a part of our felt experience. It's unseen, but we still interact with it. The inhabitants of the spiritual realm are spiritual beings. Uh, that's what we'll call them. Just you read about them in scripture as gods, lowercase g, angels, demons, etc. And in their story, in their kind of big picture meta narrative, there was a mirrored rebellion. And so there are spiritual beings who follow God and obey him and other spiritual beings who are in rebellion to him. And actually they have actions and their consequences, the good ones might have positive consequences on us, but there's also negative consequences on our daily lives from the spiritual realm. So that's a warfare worldview. But the elephant in the room is that while this was the dominant way that the biblical authors saw the world, most of us just don't think this way. In fact, this is the way that most people throughout human history have seen the world. But over the past couple hundred years, we've moved away from this because today we just think about the natural world. We rely on science and technology and what's observable and what we can prove. And if we're honest, this view of the world, this warfare worldview seems a little superstitious, backwards, maybe primitive or kind of weird. Like we know better now because we've progressed, we have science and technology now. See, I learned a new word recently that I just think is absolutely the coolest. And if you love words, you'll love this. If you don't, that's okay. You know, hands and feet inside the vehicle, we're going on a journey. Uh, the first word to introduce this word is ethnocentrism. Maybe you've heard this with a lot of the conversations that we're having right now around racism and civil unrest. Ethno, ethnos, ethnicity, it's your people, it's your culture, it's your way of viewing the world. Ethno, uh, centrism, centered around. So essentially, ethnocentrism is the belief that your culture, your people, or your view of the world is the right one. Everything else kind of centers around it. And all other human experiences are ultimately not quite right. 
Now, this could be overtly terrible, uh, like racism, for example, but we all do this on different levels in everyday life. Uh, it's just anything that you assume is a cultural norm for everybody. Uh, and it could be simple things like 12 hour time is obviously better than 24 hour time, or that ranch is the best condiment. Uh, obviously, both of those things are true, uh, but not everybody thinks that. But here's this new word that I learned recently, and it's chronocentrism. Chrono meaning time. And it's this belief that because we live in the 21st century and we have technology and the internet and science, all other cultures from the past didn't quite understand like we do. They just didn't quite get it. Essentially, this is just a fancy word to name our own natural bias to assuming that people from thousands of years ago didn't quite get it. And you see, contrary to our focus on what we can see, the biblical authors were keyed into things that many of us are just simply unaware of. And it's worth naming that bias up front that many of us bring to the table so that we can listen to what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians and learn from his wisdom. Are you with me? All right. But before we read, there's one more question we have to ask. If the Bible has a warfare worldview that assumes that there are spiritual beings that have actions and consequences for us, what are they like? Well, to answer that, we have to talk about leprechauns. You see, the first and foremost, most important thing that the biblical authors want you to know is that the God of Israel, Yahweh, is greater than all of the other gods. Just a few examples, 90, uh, Psalm 97.9 says, For you, Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all other gods. Exodus 15, 11 says, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working in wonders? See, when compared to Ra, the god of the sun in Egypt, or Marduk in Babylon, or Baal, or Zeus, Yahweh is far more powerful and holy and worthy of our devotion. But see, the thing is, a lot of us read these passages in scripture and we hear about these other gods and we just see them simply as myths that we don't really need to pay attention to. But then we find ourselves asking the question, how do statements like these in scripture even make sense if those gods don't really exist? Scholar Dr. Michael Heiser points out that we should consider how it would sound if these verses were comparing God to an imaginary creature. It wouldn't just be offensive to say that Jesus is better than, say, a leprechaun. It wouldn't even make sense to say that in a serious conversation, let alone when you're worshiping him. In other words, God isn't being compared to fake storybook characters. He's called greater than those who are actual, real, spiritual beings. Second, as we understand this warfare worldview, these real beings, whether they're angels or demons or little g gods, they do have real power to impact our world. Daniel 10 is a story that gives us this crazy example of this. He's praying and he describes this angel coming to him. And he says, and in verse 10, he says, just then a hand touched me and lifted me up. He was still trembling from the fact that he's seeing an angel. Uh, and he says, he gets up to his hands and his knees. He said, the man said to me, Daniel, you are very precious to God. So listen carefully to what I have to say to you. Stand up for I've been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up still trembling. And then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request was heard in heaven. As soon as you started to pray, your request was heard and I was sent to you. He says, I've come to answer your prayer. But for 21 days, 
the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. And then Michael, one of the archangels came to help me and I left him there for the spirit to fight with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. And now I'm here with you to explain what will happen to your people in the future for this vision concerns a time yet to come. Man, the Bible, right? Like what is going on? Daniel prayed and the only reason his prayer wasn't answered right away is because while this angel was sent to him right away, he got held up by the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia and they fought for 21 days. I don't know about you, but this is not how I typically think in everyday life. But this is the worldview of the biblical authors. Third, not only are these spiritual beings real and powerful, but the ones in rebellion to God have a leader. We meet him right away of the, at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis 3 as the snake or the serpent. And it's immediately seated that someday in that story, a human would come and become the snake crusher, uh, which we know to be Jesus. And we see this figure several other times throughout scripture. We see him in Job 1 called the Satan or the accuser. Uh, he tempts Jesus in the wilderness uh, after he's baptized. Um, this, this figure is sometimes called the evil one, the enemy, the father of lies, and many other titles. Fourth, though these, those, though these rebellious spiritual beings do have significant power, they are not equal and opposite competitors to God. Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. See, he didn't just barely squeeze out a win with a buzzer beater. When Jesus died and then rose again, he made a public spectacle of all of the spiritual beings who were fighting against him. I mean, they were put to shame for even showing up. And through Christ, you and I have the same access to his victory over them. Lastly, these rebellious spiritual beings sometimes afflict people directly, while other times they influence systems and structures. Just one example of many direct afflictions in scripture. Jesus encounters this all the time. We see this in Matthew 8. There's two men who are acting like really, really violent. Uh, people throughout the city can't pass uh, where they're at. And it's determined that they're possessed by demons or demonized. And Jesus has to pray and cast the demons out. It's the kind of story that I would normally just kind of skip past to get to the teachings. But it's true and it happens in scripture. And then Paul also talks about their influence on systems and structures in his letter to the Ephesians. Uh, he says in chapter six, for we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're not fighting against other human beings. We're actually fighting against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, against evil spirits in heavenly places. Now, that's just a very quick introduction to a warfare worldview, but it's really important because remember, this might seem weird or primitive to us, but it's a reality that the biblical authors assume and they expect us to be aware of it. With that, let's bring our open minds to 1 Thessalonians chapter two starting at the end in verse 17. So Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and this is what he says. He says, dear brothers and sisters, after we were separated from you for a little while, though our hearts never left you, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. Remember Paul and his team were kicked out of the city because of persecution. We wanted very much to come to you and I, Paul, tried again and again, but Satan prevented us. 
After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns? It's you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. We want to be with you. Finally, when we could stand it no longer, we decided to stay alone in Athens and we sent Timothy to visit you. He's our brother and God's coworker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. And we sent him to strengthen you, to encourage you in your faith, and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles that you were going through. But you know that we are destined for such troubles. Even while we were with you, we warned you that these troubles would come, and they did, as you well know. And that's why, when I could bear it no longer, I sent Timothy to find out whether your faith was still strong. I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you and that our work had been useless. Now, had we not had the previous conversation about a warfare worldview, me, I know this is true about me, but maybe for you, as we're reading this, you might have skipped over several things. But because we just talked about that, I think several phrases may stick out to us. Just to reread a few, I, Paul, tried again and again to come to you, but Satan prevented us. Timothy was sent to you to strengthen you, to encourage you, to keep you from being shaken by the troubles, or other translations say trials that you were going through. He says, you knew you were destined for such troubles, and we warned you that they would come, or other translations say that you would be persecuted. And then he says, I was afraid that the tempter had gotten the best of you. Let me put it this way, as Paul and his Tim lived on mission, sharing the gospel wherever they went, they saw great spiritual breakthrough. I mean, people came to faith, churches were planted in homes, people from different ethnic and economic backgrounds all found unity and family around a table, but they also encountered intense spiritual attack. Now, I don't know exactly what Paul meant by when he said that he was prevented by Satan, but something like this probably happened. He knew that as he tried to go back, that he would in face intense persecution, that they were trying to kill him and his team. And eventually, through prayer and through discernment, he discerned that this wasn't just angry people, that he was actually engaging in a spiritual battle. They also encountered many troubles or trials and persecution. And eventually they noticed this pattern that it wasn't just natural observable circumstances. They discerned these as spiritual battles that they were encountering on their missionary journeys. And it happened so consistently, they began to expect it. So much so that they told the Thessalonians who became new Christians to expect spiritual battles as they lived on mission. It was just a part of the cost that they counted when they continued to follow Jesus. And here's the thing. The same is true for us today. When you live on mission, sharing the gospel both with your words and the way that you share your life with other people, you will see incredible spiritual breakthrough. Heaven will come to earth, but you will also face intense spiritual battles. In fact, sometimes experiencing spiritual attack can even be sort of like a litmus test for knowing that you're on the right track, that you're living on mission and that you're encroaching on enemy territory. Paul expected this, and we should too. I remember I was talking on the phone with a friend uh, a few years back, and he was having this foreign exchange student live with him and his wife. And the student was very bright, very kind, amazing kid. And he also came from a Muslim background. And at some point in this conversation with my friend, I just felt like I needed to ask him how I could pray for him because I was sure that he was experiencing spiritual attack. It was interesting because he actually responded and said, no, actually everything's really good. I was a bit surprised and so I asked him, and this was you know, several months in at this point, I said, so have you shared the gospel with him or are you praying that, that the student would encounter Jesus while he's living with you? And he said, actually, no. 
to be honest, we hadn't even thought about it. See, put simply, if you're experiencing spiritual attack, it might be because you're living on mission. By the same token, if you're not experiencing spiritual attack, it could be that you're not living on the front lines of your missionary calling. Again, this is not a one-to-one cause effect, always true kind of thing. But if we're wise, it's something that we should consider as we're reflecting on our experiences as we step out in faith. So what are some examples of spiritual attack or, or, or spiritual battles? Well, it could come in the form of physical sickness or elevated emotional pain. Uh, you may have unexpected car troubles or several things go wrong in your house all at once. Uh, you could have financial strain come up that you weren't anticipating, or maybe you just feel overwhelmed by busyness all of the sudden. Maybe you feel extremely worn out. You could experience nightmares or heightened temptation. Really, the list goes on. And of course, what I'm not saying is that all of these things are necessarily a direct result of spiritual battle, but I am saying that these things will likely come up as you live on mission. A lot of times the only way to tell is through prayer and discernment with others. Just for example, about a year and a half ago, I was getting ready to preach at Encounter, which is like a prayer and worship night that we had here at Grace Gathering East. And uh, this was on Saturday nights. And wouldn't you know that week that I was supposed to prepare got extra busy, just things piling on, things going wrong at work and at home. And so I didn't get a lot of my prep work in until the day before. But then the day before I got really sick, I had a sore throat and a fever and just, I really felt like garbage. Uh, The next day I did end up getting enough strength to kind of finally feel like, okay, I can preach. But then as I was sharing with the leadership team, they said, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. We should have warned you. I was like, what do you mean? They said, well, as we've really been growing in the things of the Holy Spirit and praying for healing and prophecy, we've seen every single one of our teachers in the past few months get sick. I was like, what do you mean? They said, well, Paul McConaughey has taught several times and every single week that he does, he gets these migraines and headaches and everyone else who's taught has gotten sick the week before. And over time, we've started to pray and discern as a community that this isn't just a pattern, we're experiencing spiritual attack and it's something that we're praying into. Another example just took place a few weeks ago during our Alpha Holy Spirit weekend slash digital retreat slash whatever you want to call things during COVID. Uh, Basically, we had planned a kind of an extended evening to watch two of the videos about the Holy Spirit. And and we knew that it wasn't just going to be an average uh, average Alpha night. We really felt like this was going to be a pivotal moment of encouragement for our guests, people who either didn't call themselves Christians or who had had Uh, a lot of hurt with the church in the past. And wouldn't you know, Cody, who was our Zoom host, was 20 minutes late because on his way home, he got stuck behind an accident. And two of our guests couldn't make it because one got sick and the other one had a bunch of stuff come up at work. And another one had to leave halfway through because they got a migraine. And we had crazy tech issues with Zoom where there was so much lag, we had a hard time uh, conversing and some of our videos crashed, things that we had never experienced throughout Alpha leading up to this. And someone else's computer kept crashing and they kept getting booted out of their discussion group. I mean, it just felt like every little thing was going wrong. And eventually it became clear that we weren't just experiencing technical difficulties we were actually experiencing spiritual attack. And so a group of us were in a group message during uh, just praying for the night. I actually texted Barbie Balschmidt when one of our video teachings went down and within moments of her texting me back saying that she was praying for us, the video started working again. And that's just a couple small sort of everyday type examples. And maybe since I've named them, you can look back and see examples of spiritual attack in your own life. So what should we do with all of this? Should we be afraid or paranoid? Definitely not. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And as I said before, 
The victory that's in Christ lives in us and we have his authority living in us. So what do we do? Well, if we were to learn from the wisdom of Paul, there's a few things that we should consider. First, we need to identify spiritual battle from other obstacles that we may encounter and do it through prayer and community with others. See, spiritual battle and attack is just one lens for how we understand all of our experiences of brokenness or even just difficulty and challenges that come up. Other lenses that we may apply would be the consequences of our own sin, the consequences of someone else's sin, or just experiencing the natural realities of brokenness in our world. Some challenges we face might not even be evil, they might just be difficult, and they could even be God getting our attention or closing a door. That's why prayer and discernment is so important. But what happens is we start to identify these patterns and we realize that it makes more sense to name something as spiritual battle rather than just chalking it up to repeated coincidences. And sometimes as we pray, we still don't know, but that's okay. Paul and his team discern together that what they experienced was spiritual attack. And that's what we should do because it's the wise way to live. If we see enough patterns, we may start to proactively pray against these things and ask God for protection and breakthrough. Second, intercede and pray. During that Alpha Night, the group leaders, like I said, we were in this group message praying earnestly for God to protect us and to just work out all of the technology and to bring healing. And like I said, even when I texted Barbie, we started to see some immediate breakthrough. And if you discern that someone in your life or that you are encountering spiritual attack, you should pray because you have authority in Jesus' name. And like Daniel, you may even need to persevere in prayer before you see breakthrough. Third, keep pressing on, keep moving forward. See, Paul and the Thessalonians, they kept on pursuing the mission that God called them to, even though they encountered troubles and trials and persecution, and they expected it. And for us, whether or not you discern that you're experiencing spiritual attack, it doesn't really in all reality change what you do you actually continue to persevere. You may have a more pointed prayer effort, but you just keep pressing on. You stick with it unless, until you see breakthrough or unless you feel God calling you in a different direction. And lastly, encourage one another because spiritual battle can be frustrating and exhausting. Paul said that he sent Timothy to strengthen and encourage the Thessalonian believers and we, got, we have got to do the same thing. Just a few weeks ago or a few months ago, I was talking with some missional community leaders at our North site and they were just so discouraged because they couldn't seem to get people in their group to prioritize committing to meeting together. And I just encouraged them. I said, listen, as we've been praying about the north side of the city, we just really have this sense that busyness isn't just like a thing that people do. It's actually a spiritual battle. And you guys are on the front lines. So, so be encouraged. It is hard, but you have victory in Christ. Continue to persevere. God is with you. So to end... How is God getting your attention? What's he saying to you? Do you need to open up your mind to the reality of the spiritual realm and how it impacts us? Do you need to discern that the obstacles that you're experiencing right now as you're stepping out in faith or on mission are actually spiritual attack and then pray specifically against that? Do you need to be praying against spiritual battle for yourself or for other people? Or do you just need to encourage someone or be encouraged yourself? As we head into response, I'll just end with Jesus's words from John 16. It's one of my favorite verses. He says this, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Let's take time to respond together.
Man, listen, I tell you, as you're hearing the word today, thank God for Brian Menzi as he uh, reminded us that we are in spiritual warfare. Uh, this particular passage, as Paul was sharing, uh, I, I, there's so much that we want to just take in. But specifically, when Paul was saying that uh, they were trying to come back and, and to talk to those who were uh, in the Thessalonians, but he was hindered. Uh, at the beginning of the message you heard uh, Brian sharing, it was, it was even in the book of Daniel where the prince of Persia, the principality of the air was hindering, was, was stopping or slowing some things down. And so what we want to do is recognize that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but powers, principalities, spiritual wickedness in the heavenly realm. What is God saying to you? I believe there's some thoughts that uh, Brian ended with that I want to just bring back to our attention um, because in order for us as believers, uh, as, as, as a body, as a family, wherever you may be, uh, in order for us to be uh, overcomers, uh, he shared something with this. Number one, identify spiritual attacks from other forms of obstacles or challenges. You've got to know that there's a difference. There may be some things happening in the natural, but then there's some things. He gave us the, a chart that let us know that there's some things that are happening uh, in the spirit world. Distinguish the difference between the two. But then the second thing, you've got to intercede, you've got to pray. Uh, we want to pray until you pray. Intercede. Uh, pray for your family. Uh, pray for uh, even your own physical body. But we're asking God for his presence and his protection when we pray and intercede. But then I love it. You've got to keep pressing on. Uh, there, there's going to be times, just like Paul said, um, that he was feeling hindered and feeling buffeted. It. But the good thing was he, he was able to finally send Timothy. So we have to be praying for one another um, so that eventually there is a breakthrough. And then finally, uh, not only do you need to identify spiritual attacks from other forms, intercede and pray um, uh, for one another, keep pressing on, but encourage one another. These are times that we just need to feel encouraged. Encourage each other in the Lord. I want to just pray with us just real quick. And uh, we're, the worship team is going to come back. But Father, we thank you right now for your great grace, your great mercy, and your great peace. Your grace uh, that is enough for us. It's sufficient for us. Your power is perfected in our weaknesses, especially when we're dealing uh, with this spiritual warfare, when we're dealing, Father, with strongholds, strongholds that are ignored, uh, the devil, Satan, tries to control. But greater are you who lives in us than he that lives in the world. And so, Father, we thank you now. We look to you for the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and we are safe. Thank you, Father. So let's join in as we worship. Oh 
miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop I believe even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop never stop. You are way maker, miracle work, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. Never stop. So again, thank you everybody for joining in uh, to Grace Gathering Online. I hope you are lifted uh, by hearing the word. Your faith is increased, I know it is, by hearing the message and hearing by the word of God. Tune in next week, but remember this, the best is yet to come. Bye-bye. Hey everyone, Chris Norman here. Hope you're all doing okay during what is still a very difficult time in our country and in our world. Wanted to give you an update as we go into yet another month of this terrible pandemic. We are certainly seeing more positive COVID-19 cases, not only in our country and in our state, but now even within our own church family, including one of our elders. I think we were all hoping that things would be much better by now, but we must continue to pray uh, for healing and for protection and for overall health. We're all tired of this pandemic, but now is not the time to get discouraged or to give up prayer or taking the necessary safety measures. Our elders have recently met and decided that we'll continue with our current status quo of having partially opened Sunday morning gatherings. We'll maintain this current plan until at least Labor Day weekend, and then we'll reevaluate any changes at that time. We'll keep our Sunday mornings at each of our sites relatively fluid uh, throughout the month of August with a mixture of both recorded or live elements of both worship and the sermons. We wanna give the schools an opportunity to open up and get a couple of weeks under their belt before we decide how we're handling children's ministry at Grace Gathering. And so we're hoping to move forward in this regard after Labor Day, but we'll see how things uh, unfold. And let me just say a couple other uh, way, things of encouragement. Number one, while our financial giving has been down some, I've been told that the number of givers has stayed consistent during these past several months. And so the elders just wanna say thank you for your consistency in giving. We feel so blessed and we feel so grateful. Number two, while our Sunday morning gatherings have been in flux, which we call the Gather Church, a good portion of our church body is staying connected in what we call the Scatter Church, relationships and connections during the week outside of the four walls of the building. In fact, right now we're having discussions as a staff for new opportunities that we'll have this fall for people to get connected to one another. And number three, the last thing I wanna say by way of encouragement is that in spite of both the pandemic and the civil unrest our country has faced this summer, this is such an opportunity for the church to shine in this difficult time. This is really our time, loving one another, encouraging one another, 
engaging people in our community, standing up for unity, standing up for justice, praying for one another to be healed and protected. We will not give way to fear. We will not give way to being defeated. We will not be the same on the other side. God has a purpose in this all and we will continue to trust him completely. We love you, we stand together in God's kingdom. Be blessed and we'll see you soon.